It's a pleasure to be here um, to share with you, I think, the next very bold story of this uh, great country, and that's about genomics. We all re remember, or I vividly remember, born in that year, that in 53, the double helix was discovered in Cambridge. And I think I want to give you the journey that we are now making to open up what this is going to mean for patient care. And Britain loves bold initiatives. I think this bridge that allows a much more rapid journey to happen was a foster design. The engineering was done by the Germans and it was built by the French. So it shows a good tradition of collaboration in bold undertakings by this nation. And I think that the parallel to genomics can be made because many exciting journeys are now being made in the field of genomics. And I think that this bridge will show to you how we can link these advances to improvements in patient care. The Human Genome Project, but again was one of these ideas in the, in the mid 80s from let's try it. And actually one of the persons who has been leading it sits here in the middle in the front seat uh, David Bentley was one of the engineers in the early days to move this project forward. And this country has sequenced the largest fraction of the human genome. And this is where we sit. I always find it a bit, if the researchers as, are going through the databases and, and give you the next statistics about the human genome, it's always a bit mind boggling that, that what makes us is around a 30 billion sure. basis. And it is that information that comprises the 21,000 genes that makes us up and codes for the proteins that uh, bring life together. But I think what is the intriguing area where we're now moving into is obviously when the genome was completed, there was the classic discussion from if only 2% code, what is the rest doing? And you may all remember the stories about the junk of the genome. And that is where the switches and the dimmers are sitting. And I think we very systematically are now sorting out where the switches are and where the dimmers are. And it will not surprise you that for every different cell type in your body, the switches and the dimmers are sitting in a slightly different position. And you now suddenly understand why this 98% of the genomic space needs to be there, like the lights here are beautifully controlled. Every light has a switch. Every light has its dimmer. There are master switches behind there at the table in the genome. This must be the same. I was told, and we did some checking on it, that it only took 30,000 men years to read the genome for the first time. So being Dutch, I like to put a price tag to this, and this was not a cheap undertaking. I think it is therefore even more powerful to realize that it only took 10% of the time to scan the genome of 200,000 people for variation. It could have been your genome, it could have been the genome from the 15,000 to 20,000 people in this country, or we think by now 40,000 people, is Britain has reached out across the globe to drive forward a network of extensive genome scanning where we have been leading the way, although we have to admit that maybe Iceland was once in a while a bit earlier. This scanning of the genome for variation, the differences between you and the person who sits beside you, has opened up an enormous treasure trove of new information. And I think we have been talking today a lot with each other how medicine is going to be changed. Future treatments increasingly will be based on understanding the molecular basis of disease. And these 1,600 new signposts that have been planted in the genome will become the driver of innovation in healthcare. What now? Cambridge invents a machine 10 years ago. An Indian scientist came to Cambridge to do blue sky research. The classic story is he went to the pub, was sitting there with a physicist and a chemist and some other people and said, let's make the next sequencing machine that can read the genetic code quickly. I met with the capital investor, the venture capitalist investor who invested in this technology. She said she had never taken such a big risk. This technology 
is now the leading sequencing technology for all the genome centers in the world. And if we have to believe Oxford, again, this country consists the most innovative next sequencing technology that will even read the genetic code quicker. And that brings me to the third line. It now takes only 30 man years. And that I can comprehend because that's 30 times 50,000 pounds. So that's not that much money to read the genome of 10,000 patients. And you do that in a year. And this is transformative. We go to apply this to rare diseases and again want to show you how by collaborating internationally and being a trusted partner for data gathering that we can, can these enormous projects can be uh, taking place over the coming years. May I remind you, your height is regulated. If you do the simple sum and take the height of your mother and your father and you add it up and you divide it by two, you're pretty close to your own height and you have to assume if they are way out, you might have to maybe ask about something. <laughs> yeah, I want to ask whether you had maybe a mutation. You were asking yourself another question. But, okay, let's look at height. There are many, many genes. We had described together as part of a global consortium. 200 genes that regulate your height and the variation in every gene has a small effect. This was predicted by Fischer in 1953 in Cambridge that this is what's going to be discovered. Environment, diet, pollution, what have you so, does have its effects. Now let's go to the rare diseases. There I think we need to get comfortable that you get a variant or a very rare variant, or as we would say, a mutation in one gene from your mother and maybe in another gene from your father. But because these two genes encode proteins that have to collaborate in a single important pathway, therefore the child will be very ill. And this is where we now go to move. And you will say, from, this is not important. Rare diseases, the word says that this is rare. This is not of public health importance. 7% of the people in this room might have a rare disease. I would say have a rare disease. And several of these people will have a very shortened survival. 7% of the children born in this country suffer from a rare disease. So the word rare is a misnomer, and it's therefore important from a public health point of view to resolve the basis and take away this anguish for the parents that they do not know what is wrong with their child. This two and a half year diagnostic delay in our good NHS, and this is similar in other healthcare systems in the world. So as one of my colleagues said, let's get on with it and solve this problem. But discovering the genetic base of rare diseases has been at the basis of many drugs that are used by many of you in this room. The statins were initially developed for a number of small number of families in Boston because they had the wrong lipids. That statins have become a global drug that is used to improve health. Might surprise you that it started with research in the rare disease field. When I met uh, my genomics colleagues from the Sanger Institute in uh, 2000 when the draft genome was sequenced, the map was empty. There were some historical signposts that were the, the signposts of the known genetic disorders that had been discovered, but we didn't know the control. So I go to show you one piece of my own research that I've co-led with Nicole Sorenzo at the Sanger Institute, which is one of the biggest genome centers, as you will know, in the world. But before going there, no, I will uh, talk I'm about collaboration. In the field of thrombosis research uh, are based on very complicated and expensive methodology and it is simply too expensive to do it in a little country as Holland on your own. You have to share the facilities and the knowledge. This is rather a strong statement for a Dutch person. It's a rich country, but you have to globally collaborate. You have to merge data in the genomics field and that's what we have been doing. We brought data together from 67,000 people and instead of having an empty map, we now suddenly have at the left a map of 68 signposts in the genome that regulate the number of platelets you have that are the cells that make your blood clot. But they are also the cells that give you your stroke and your heart attack 
and any patient who has had a heart attack leaves the clinic with two platelet inhibitors. We want to make safer and better drugs. This will help us to pioneer those drugs. At the right, you see a similar map suddenly of all the genes that control the formation of your red cells. And you can say, from, but anemia is no problem. But globally, anemia is one of the major health problems. So instead of having no knowledge about how these cells are formed in your bone marrow, you now suddenly have an extensive catalog of new data, which now can be mined by the basic cell biology research, uh, researchers, not in Cambridge. Yes, in Cambridge, but across the world. What about NIHR's initiatives to get the rare disease fields opened up and take strategic initiatives in which this country can lead? Wellcome Trust and Sanger Institute have already commenced to sequencing of around 20,000 people who have suffered from a rare disease. This has now been upped with another 5,000 by NIHR as a test study across the London and internationally. And you see again how we're building global networks and increasingly are spending to bring patients from across the world to the Sanger Institute to get their genomes analyzed and to get the statistical analysis performed. Does it work? May I remind you, someone with a rare disorder has a, a gene that doesn't work from mother and one from the father. And we took two examples of here you have a family that have severe bleeding because the platelets, as you can see, normally platelets are very small at the top in the green circle, but in these patients you have very big platelets in the red circle, and those people bleed severely. We now realize that they also have very severe autoimmune diseases, and we have discovered a gene by only sequencing the, the DNA of six of those patients. In the past, this would have been work for 10 postdocs and for 10 years of work. Or actually, our team in America had worked for 15 years on that, and we solved this in two months' time. Can you continue to do that? There's here, an, again, a rare syndrome where babies bleed, but more importantly, they have mis malformations from their arms, but also their legs. Um, and again, by sequencing only six patients from Germany, we did find a mutation that drives this, and that mutation is present in one in 30 of you. But don't worry, your child won't get this disease, except if you marry with someone who has misses a big part of their genome at the same place. I think it comes very nicely back to the first presentation about what is driving, driven by the Institute of Psychiatry and capturing patient data. We will need to evolve, and this is a big medical education task, to a new way of coding the clinical phenotype. ICD codes are not of great use, but we need to take the richness of human disease and capture this phenotype in a new taxonomy that we internationally and globally need to agree on. And we are trialing this out on the first 40,000 patients in the NHS. It is this use of the new technology that will be better allow us to define the relationship between changes in your genome and health and the state of ill health. You see in this movie a cell in your bone marrow, the cell in your bone marrow that is making platelets. And that cell is nicely lying against the blood vessels and each time a platelet is produced it is shot into the blood. And there are a large number of proteins at the left that are doing this job of coordinating this cell in doing this task. And for those of you who have been flying into Terminal 5, this might more look like the, the network of airports in the world. But you see that there are highly connected hubs like Terminal 5, or like Schiphol Airport, or like Hong Kong. The general idea is that this cell cannot do its job if you take one of those highly connected hubs out of the system. The reason why we on the computer can build these big networks of proteins that control your cells in your brain and of your platelets or your red blood cells is because the European Bioinformatics Institute, that's the biggest data integration site in Europe for, for biological data, is in Cambridge and it's just an investment of 65 million by this government to expand this institute and double it in size as we all realize that combining data across the globe will be the powerful driving engine for innovation in healthcare. 
I was also pleased, and particularly being Dutch and not the biggest friend of Elsevier's as a publishing house, that this government has carried through the strategy of the Wellcome Trust that there should be open access to all the data that are generated, paid by the public, and that they should not be hidden away in publishing houses that make this inaccessible for large parts of the world. So all the data that we produce and this country produces in five years' time, 80% of those data must be in open access environment, and we hope the world will control us. It's been a pleasure for you to take the clouds around the genomics away, to tell that genomics at great speed, now that the cloud is gone, will drive into clinical medicine, it will apply in cancer care, it will improve the care of patients with rare diseases, which affects 7% of the people sitting in this room, and we see a great role for its uh, application in the area of infectious diseases. Thank you very much.